Last month, thousands of trade unionists, environmentalists, socialists, and right act activists were among those taking part in protests organized by the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, which aimed to challenge the agenda of the G8 leaders during the G8 meeting. In Italy, there were numerous demonstrations and several general strikes organized by Italy's labor unions, which led to the fall of the, of the president. Then, the mass movement staged a massive protest action against the new government this May, in May this year, with the labor unions urging the new prime minister, Enrico Letta, to focus on job growth instead of aust an austerity agenda. In Greece, we see a persistent and intense fight back, especially where labor unions held their fourth general strike and a massive demonstration on July 17th, just about two weeks ago. Organized workers and people continue to take to the streets in Romania and Turkey. As a matter of fact, just a few days ago, the people of Bulgaria engaged in a massive demonstration against corruption. Even right here in the Western Hemisphere, our neighbors in Brazil have been staging massive demonstrations between the months of June and July this year. Mr. Chairman, this is the global response as the world's citizens attempt to fight back and reclaim their countries from the ruthless and corrupt hands of the politicians demanding radical change in the power relations. So this evening I pose the question, what about our beloved Trinidad and Tobago? Mr. Chairman, let us look at the crisis in our economy. We have to pay close attention as the political directorate and their cronies in the central bank will try to fool us into believing that all is well with our economy. The truth is that real GDP in Trinidad and Tobago declined by 4.5% in 2009 and growth was 0% in 2010. Real GDP declined further by just over 2.5% in 2011. Economic growth in 2012, according to the Central Bank, was, and I quote, considerably weaker than anticipated, end quote. The bank listed delays in maintenance and upgrade at energy companies, which led to, and I quote, larger than expected decline in natural gas production. The sharp shortfall in natural gas production adversely affected both refining activity and output of petrochemicals, end quote. This is coupled with the continued decline in our country's crude oil production. Whilst the bank stated that the non-energy sector continued its slow but steady pace of revival, the bank also recognized that it could not fully offset the contraction in energy output. Accordingly, estimates from the central bank's quarterly real GDP index indicated that the domestic economy grew by a mere 0.2% in 2012. Based on their preliminary estimates, the Trinidad and Tobago economy grew by 1.7% in the first three months of 2013. However, this minuscule growth is taking place in the non-energy sector and is driven by government spending and government squandermania. So if we compare that data with the non-energy fiscal deficit, the real picture begins to emerge. In 2012, the amount owed in non-energy sector increased to 31.5 billion compared with 28.4 billion in the previous year. In addition, the overall debt of the central government operations increased from almost 4 billion in 2011 to 6.6 .6 billion in 2012. What about our public debt? Well, Comrade Chairman, the nation's public debt increased from TT54 billion in 2011 to TT71.6 billion in 2012, which means the ratio of debt to GDP rose from 36.2% to 46.6%, a whole 10% jump in just one year. Come on, Chairman, it is important to remember when the government is boasting 
that it is weathering the global economic crisis. It is only because they used taxpayers' money to bail out CL Financial. In the end, it is the people's money that saved us from complete economic collapse and not at the economic policies of this government. Mr. Chairman, let me expose another truth in terms of employment. The government boasts that the unemployment rate fell from 5.8% in 2011 to 4.9% in 2012. However, the fact is that more recent data and retrenchment notices suggest that employment conditions have subsequently deteriorated. Retrenchment notices filed with the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Labor, small and micro enterprises increased by almost 16% in the first five months of 2013 when compared with the same period of 2012. In addition, the government again tries to boast that inflation eased to around 5.5% in May of 2013. The first thing to always remember is that inflation means the rate of increase. A decline in inflation does not mean a decline in prices, but simply a slowing down of the rate of increase. But more importantly, is the illusion of the government's gimmickry when they remove VAT and selected non-luxury food items in mid November of 2012. The reality for ordinary people is different. Let me give one simple, very simple, but real example. A single mom purchased a pack of Bermuda's vanilla biscuit for her child at $6.50 during 2011. The price increased to $7 in early 2012, and then suddenly jumped to $8. Following the fanfare of the government's removal of VAT, it dropped to $6.50, but within weeks returned to $8, and that is a small pack of sweet biscuits. This is an 18.75% increase in one year. In just one simple but real example, we are seeing what is facing the people. The double digits, real increases in prices are against the background of mega single digit salary increases over a three year period. And even a 5% cap for some workers over that three year period. Kama Chairman, the conclusion is clear. The economy of Trinidad and Tobago is in serious crisis. Even members of the business community have been complaining to us daily that business is slow, and in some cases, business is dead. They speak quietly in hushed tones about the lack of pro proper economic directions coming from this government. It is a fact that absolutely no new investment has come on stream. This government has absolutely no plans for stimulating or reviving the economy. Their plan is simple. It is to steal and steal and steal. Kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Or if that goose is gray, Drink it and stagger and stumble their way through the entire turbine office. It is not just at macro levels, but it is also at micro levels affecting ordinary people. When we see this real picture of the state of our economy, understanding the direct impact it is having on the lives of ordinary people, then we know that we really have no choice. We have to and we must respond. Come on, Chairman, the poor management of our economy is further exacerbated by bad governance and corruption. The central bank governor in his address at a meeting of the American Chamber of Commerce just earlier this month admitted, and I quote, economic growth was considerably weaker than anticipated as maintenance and safety upgrades at energy companies extended further into the year than originally envisaged." End quote. This is the point we have been making about 
the poor state of petrol trim. This is the sorry state of affairs of the petroleum company of Trinidad and Tobago, and it is as a direct result of bad governance. Appointments to the board is based on party loyalty and party support, and not based on experience, competence, or qualification. There are members sitting on that board who seek their own personal interests and the interests of the party at the expense of national interests. What is even worse is that political appointments, those political appointments, did not stop at the level of the boards, but it reached top and lower management positions. Now it is moving throughout the company and even threatened to go into casual employment. Can you imagine recruitment only based on party loyalty? Today, the adverse effect on Petrochain's performance is painfully obvious. This, 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 Comrade Chairman, this is UNC style of governance, and it has impacted negatively on operations on one of the country's most important state enterprises, to the point that it is delaying economic growth. These are the linkages we must make. There are many other examples of bad governance in other state enterprises throughout Trinidad and Tobago. But I used Petrochin specifically because of its significant contribution to the economy. We have always maintained that Petrochin did not belong to Patrick Manning and Malcolm Jones. And it certainly does not belong to Kevin Ramnarain or Kamla Passard, Bissessa, and their political cronies of the UNC. Petrochin belongs to all of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Chairman, this also facilitates outright corruption and nepotism. In 2010, Trinidad and Tobago ranked 73 out of 178 countries on the Corruption Perception Index. By December 2012, we ranked 80 out of 176 countries, which means in just two years, we have fallen in rankings. We have gotten worse. We have said it before, and we maintain that under the People's Partnership government, the country has seen the highest level of corruption in the shortest possible time. It used to be every other day, but now it is every day. Every day there is a major scandal and bacchanal in the People's Partnership government. And now with the Chagonas West elections in full swing, we see corruption allegations flying left, right, and center. Whilst they mudsling, we still have no explanation for the ridiculous $6.8 million payment for the wrecking of a fire truck. There is no explanation for the outrageous Section 34. There is no explanation for the elusive FIA Rishni Ramnarain or for Prime Minister's freeloading sister or for the cost of the India trip. There is no explanation for the Prime Minister's unusual stay at the Gopals, or for the Prime Minister's overall disregard and contempt for protocol, or for giving away NP service stations to their friends. There is no rational explanation for the highway extension to the bay, costing taxpayers an additional $4 billion. There is no explanation for the several multi-million dollar briefs coming from the Attorney General's office. There's no explanation for the massive increase in various ministries' expenditure. No logical explanation for the Prime Minister to have abandoned the Prime Minister's official residence and to take the country's business to a private residence in Philippines. More than all of that, there's still no explanation for the unwarranted state of emergency other than to style the mobilization of the labor movement in our mobilization for a general strike. Comrade Chairman, let us ask the question, why should we care about our politicians' involvement in deep corruption? Let's ask that question. Why should we care about accusations being made by the Prime Minister